Oh, welcome back, my fellow watchers of the multiverse, to another brand new If I Had Written episode. And in today's episode, we are finally taking a look at MCU's Spider Man 4. This video wouldn't be done. It wouldn't have happened without Zachary Stonebreaker. He is a Patreon member and he requested me to do this storyline. He wanted me to do a MCU Spider-Man 4 if I had written episode and he commissioned it through Patreon and I honestly had a lot of fun working with him, you know, on this, and I cannot thank Zachary enough, so we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for him. But that being said, my fellow watchers, let's dive in to the brand new, if I had written, MCU's Spider-Man 4. Peter had never felt alone like he did now. After the death of his Aunt May, Peter had desperately tried to avenge her death by killing the one man that was responsible, Norman Osborn. But he was stopped from making this decision that would taint his soul by his variant from another Earth. Peter was forced to make the grown-up decision, something that would save his whole Earth from imminent collapse. He asked Doctor Strange to wipe out the memories of everyone that ever knew him. This spell affected his girlfriend, Michelle Jones, and his best friend, Ned. They had forgotten who he was. Peter was truly alone. No surviving family member, and no friends that remembered who he was. Peter had been forced to move into another apartment, as he could not afford the apartment he and his Aunt May had been staying in. His life was in shambles, but he knew he had to forge ahead, or the plan that Aunt May had for him. While she was alive, she had been saving money into an account for him, his college fund. He was to gain access into the account by any of the two conditions, if he had turned 18, if she had died. The two conditions had been met. He turned 18, and his Aunt May had been killed. He had been called by the bank to sort out the next of kin issues and gain access to the money, which was sufficient for his college funding, his fees in particular. Regardless of the financial aid which he had received, Peter knew he needed a job if he would want to keep surviving. He needed to eat, to pay his rent, and sort out some other bills. Peter was smart but he couldn't get jobs in the place where his brains would be put to good use. He could only apply as an intern, and that was not what he wanted. He wanted a job that would pay well but while he was tackling school and the job. Parker sat daily, flipping through the pages of the newspaper, searching for jobs. It was on one of those occasions that he found a job advertisement for the Daily Bugle. Peter was not a fan of the Daily Bugle. It was the same media house that had reportedly tarnished his image as Spider-Man. They had called him names while he was still stopping petty crimes. It had also been the editor-in-chief of the publishing house, J. Jonah Jameson, that had broadcasted the news. The news of his reveal who he was, and that he allegedly killed Mysterio. Peter knew that he wasn't supposed to have anything to do with them, but he needed the money. They were looking for a photographer and a reporter. Peter thought he could apply for the two positions and possibly combine them so that he would get the extra pay. The interview was the following day. Peter circled the advertisement with a marker and stood up to prepare what he would wear the following day. If he had remembered correctly, Aunt May told him to always wear a tie and a suit for formal events. The memory brought pain to his heart and fresh tears. Peter realized that if he was going to work at the Daily Bugle, he would probably have to hate Spider-Man as much as the editor-in-chief did. He had no choice. Peter was prepared for the interview. He needed the job badly because he was resuming college the following week, and that he needed to know that he had a steady source of income before he went to school. Peter stepped into the media house, and he saw a section reserved for applicants. It was a fully seated session, 
It turned out that he was not the only one that needed the job. Peter signed and walked toward the section. He had not been his normal self. He was more reversed these days and kept to himself. Back then, he would have made it a duty to familiarize himself with every applicant and know their names. But Peter shuffled close to the window, waiting for his name to be called. He hated what he had in mind to do. He was willing to go to the extreme lengths to ensure that he would get the job. When Peter's name was called, he dusted his pants and walked towards the room where a man was waiting by the door. Parker walked through and didn't attempt to make small talk with him. The man led him into another office for his interview. He opened the door and left Peter to walk in. Normally, the man gave people advice to who were courteous enough to acknowledge his presence. Peter didn't deserve such advice. Peter put up his best fake smile and walked in. He tried to exclude the confidence and happiness which were polar opposite of the feeling and emotions he was going through at the moment. Jonah Jameson told him to sit, and he asked for his qualifications. Peter had none, and told him so. He told Jonah the truth, that he was a college student who needed a job. Jonah stared at him for a minute, and shouted for the next person. Peter's eyes went wide like saucers. He began to grapple at words, trying to convince Jonah to give him a chance to work, that he would prove himself worthy. Jonah acted like there was no one in the room, flipping through documents which he had seen a thousand times before. The man who had escorted Peter walked in and began to usher Peter out of the office. Peter knew it was now or never. He had to use the trick which he had not planned to bring out just yet. Parker shouted that he had pictures of Spider-Man. Jonah Jameson's head shot up. He raised his hand and halted the man from pulling Peter out of the conference room. Jonah asked for the clarification on what he had heard Peter say. Peter repeated himself. As long as he could remember, Jonah had this deep hatred for the web crawler. The spell Strange had casted had erased the image of the man behind the mask, but had not erased the hero himself. Jonah Jameson was back to his default setting of the endless quest to discover who the man behind the mask was. His only tactic was to probe the hero with his negative reviews and force him to reveal himself to the public. Peter removed himself from the handlock which the man had held him in. He opened his strap bag and pulled out pictures of Spider-Man in action. He had deliberately taken pictures of himself while he was still engaging in petty saves. Jonah had stood up from his seat and walked to Peter to see the photos he had pulled out from his bag. He gazed at the beautiful taken shots. Peter and Aunt May used to take photos of nature every time they went on their hikes. This had developed Peter's love for nature and photography. He looked at Parker and asked if he had taken the pictures himself, to which Peter responded positively. Peter seized the opportunity to express his deep resentment of Spider-Man to Jonah. Peter didn't want to, but he thought of the bills he had to pay. He felt that he had no choice. Peter told Jonah that Spider-Man was back to his criminal ways. Parker had deliberately referenced the phase Jonah usually used to reference to Spider-Man's neighborhood savings. Jonah nodded affirmatively, and Peter knew he had his window of opportunity. Jonah signaled the man still standing behind, unsure of what to do to leave them alone. He gestured for Parker to sit. Peter sat knowing that he had the upper hand. He told Jonah how much he hated Spider-Man, with each word that left Peter's mouth, commending his alter ego and what he stood for. His fist tightened, and his nails dug into his palms. Peter continued to feed Jonah with the words he wanted to hear. He crowned the story with what J. Jonah Jameson had been looking for all along. He told him that if they were to hire him, he would be able to expose Spider-Man for the fraud that he was even though it would take time. Jonah nodded. He had found his reporter 
and photographer. Jonah signaled for the man and told him to send the remaining applicants home that he had hired whom he was looking for all along. The man nodded, stared hard at Peter, and left to do what he was told. He shook hands with Peter and told him that he could start work the following week. He told him that he needed his college schedule so that they could work out his favorable hours for him and his classes. Jonah held on to the pictures. He already had a story in mind. Location, the college. Date, January 2025, 7.51 a.m. Peter was a mixture of emotions. He was excited on one hand about beginning college. On the other hand, he felt he had no reason to be excited. He had no one to share his experiences with. He had a dream about going to MIT with his friends, but the whole ordeal with the villains had trashed that idea for him. His friends were going, and that was enough for him. Peter walked into the community college and headed straight for the admission block because he was unsure of what to do. Peter bumped into a girl. Her beauty captured his attention. He shook his head. He remembered MJ. He shouldn't be admiring anyone like that. He apologized and left. He stopped. He didn't know where the administration block was. He signed, turned, and he asked her. She was still standing as if she was waiting for him to turn back. She told him that she was headed to the administration block too. Peter gave a shy smile and followed her. He introduced himself as Peter Parker. The girl stopped. She stared at him, wide-eyed, and told him that she knew who he was. Peter's heart began to beat. A lot of thoughts went through his mind. He wondered if Strange's spell had gone wrong, or if anything had interrupted the spell again. How did she remember who he was? These were the thoughts going through his mind. The girl interrupted in laughter. She told him that she was joking and she really had no idea who he was. Peter felt himself breathe again. He hadn't realized he had held his breath for that long. She introduced herself as Gwen Stacy and smiled. Peter tried to make small talk, but he couldn't. He had been so alone that communicating with other humans was a problem for him now. But Gwen didn't seem to mind. She talked a lot. She talked about everything and sometimes asked him direct questions, which Peter needed to answer to avoid being rude. Peter chattered himself. He was behaving like a high schooler. This was college and he needed to start acting like a college kid. He needed to take control of the situation and be himself. Peter said the first thing that came out of his mouth. He asked Gwen if she usually talked too much. Gwen paused and squinted at him. Peter realized what he had said was offensive. He began to apologize rapidly, stuttering over and over again. Gwen smiled and told him that she actually talked a lot and she wasn't offended by the question. They arrived at the administration block and they were given their schedules. It turned out that Gwen was already a freshman, but she had arrived a couple of days earlier in order to familiarize herself with the environment. They were taking the same engineering courses. Gwen smiled and said that she was impressed. Peter didn't know why, but it made him feel good. He hated and loved the feeling of impressing Gwen. She took his hand and told him that she wanted to introduce him to her friends. Peter stared at their intertwined hands and shook his head. He assumed that she was probably free like that with every person. Gwen introduced him to her friends, Harry Osborne and Eddie Brock. Gwen Stacy immediately left his hand and went to hug Harry. She kissed him and then introduced Peter Parker to them. Peter felt this tiny ting of hurt and satisfaction. Hurt that Gwen was already off the market, and satisfaction because he wouldn't have to do anything with her, thereby cheating on MJ. Peter observed Harry as he shook his hands. He looked rich, very rich. His mind clicked, Harry Osborne. This was the son of Norman, the man who had killed his Aunt May. Peter Parker's grip unintentionally tightened around Harry's hand. Harry chuckled and shook his hand in order to release the grip he had. Parker came back to reality. He needed to find out if he was indeed the son of Norman. If he was, 
then a lot of questions would follow suit. He greeted Eddie Brock, who seemed in a hurry to leave. Eddie whispered into Harry's ear, shook his hands, and left. Peter turned back to Harry. He needed to strike a conversation with him. He observed him quickly. He looked too wealthy to be in a community college. He asked Harry if he was actually being schooled in the college. Harry laughed, because he had gotten the questions a lot of the time. He told Peter that he wanted to know why someone as wealthy as he would be doing in a community college when he could be doing other things and being at other schools. Peter nodded and noted to himself that Harry was proud and loved talking about himself. It would be easy. Gwen rolled her eyes because she had heard the story a lot. Harry told Peter that he didn't want to be far away from Gwen. He told Peter that he had tried to convince Gwen to follow him to a better college, but she had rejected every financial aid he had given to her. So. He made the choice of following her to the community college. At least he would have more money to spend on different activities than on tuition. Peter gave a fake laugh. He hadn't gotten the answer that he wanted. He pressed on. He directly asked him if he was the son of Norman Osborne. Harry looked at him and nodded. His eyes had squinted, as if it was irritating him. Harry asked if he was some paparazzi or a beggar. Gwen smacked his arm. Peter retorted by telling him that he was sure the community college was the only place that would accept his grades, even without his money. Harry laughed and wrapped his arm around Peter's neck. He told Peter that they would get along splendidly before he gave a genuine smile. Peter let out a sign. His life needed to stop revolving around the same circle that would remind him of the past he was desperately trying to forget. Location. Daily Bugle. Jonah had published his news about Spider-Man, coming back to his life of petty crimes. He had written about Peter going into hiding because he wasn't able to withstand the heat of the truth when he was confronted with it. The truth being that he was no different from the street urchins and criminals. The only thing that set him aside was the fact that he was more glorified with his mask and his full bodysuit. JJJ still gave the advice he had been giving all along. He told Spider-Man that if he wanted to be a true hero, that he would remove his mask and reveal his identity to the world. Only then would he be regarded as a hero. Jonah had used the stellar photos that his news reporter had taken. The photos were good, too good to be taken by just anybody. He was going to request for another photo from him, and if it was good as the photos then, he would have to investigate his sources. He had been working on Spider-Man for years, and he had a lot of people under him, yet they never took such photos like this. He sent a reminder to Peter Parker, asking him to bring more photos of Spider-Man in more incriminating positions. He stared at the photos, mind twisting and turning every minute. Location, Peter's apartment, 2.49 p.m. Peter had received the message. He had to take another picture of himself in a incriminating position. He signed because he knew what he had to do. He had no choice. Tony Stark and his will had been at the back of his mind. Stark had put him in his will by giving him some monetary aid, but Peter was stubborn and he didn't want anything to do with the money. After the very glasses Edith, which Tony Stark had willed to him, had caused the death of his Aunt May, he was determined to stay away from anything related to Stark. It was a stupid decision. Peter knew but he was still upset. He was upset that Tony had trusted him to make the right decision with the glasses, which was beyond him. He was upset with himself that whenever he thought of Tony, anger arose instead of the found memory that they had. Peter shook his head. He had a stressful day. Gwen Stacy and her boyfriend were a mouthful. They had taken him around school. They had gotten him lunch and everything. Initially, he had this dislike for Harry due to his affiliation with Norman, but he had soon found out that inside the prideful shell that Harry portrayed, he was nothing like his dad. Peter needed just a day to know that. They had tried to make him comfortable with them. They hadn't flaunted their relationship and made him feel like a third wheel among them. Peter had gotten comfortable with them and he was very happy to start making new friends, considering how alone he had been for so long. Peter reasoned. 
he needed to think about what to do about the photos, which he was supposed to take for work. He had a few minutes left before he was going to work. He had sent out his schedule early to J. Jonah Jameson, who had quickly replied with an after-school work hour for Peter. Peter wore a suit, signed and leaped out of the window to take some pictures before work. He ensured that his normal clothes were in his bag before he left the window. Anything was better than being dependent on Tony Stark's will. Peter arrived at work on time, and it was 3.12 p.m., with the pictures which J. Jonah Jameson had asked him to take. He ensured that the photos were set on timer and placed in corners where it seemed like he would hide to take photos. Peter clenched his bag tightly as he walked into his boss's office. He felt slight shame when he knew he had done the things he had done. He knocked on his door and entered. J. Jonah Jameson beamed when he saw him. He was happy to receive the pictures, not on seeing Peter. He needed more dirt on Spider-Man, and he needed to confirm his suspicions. His suspicion being Peter knew, or had close relationships with Spider-Man. Jonah wanted to see how authentic the next set of photos were that Peter would bring him. If they were as good as the first, then he knew he would have to investigate the news reporter he had hired. Peter handed the photos over to him, and J. Jonah Jameson grabbed it. He told Peter to leave. As soon as Parker left, Jonah opened the file and pulled out the photos. He checked the pictures, and they were even better than the last ones. Jonah smiled. He had one in two ways. The reporter had supplied him with quality photos of Spider-Man that would amp up his reports. The reporter had proven to be closely connected with Spider-Man. J. Jonah Jameson knew there was only one person he could trust to find out the truth and report back to him, and it was an old friend, Mac Gargan. Mac Gargan was a private investigator who Jonah had hired to trail certain superheroes and reveal their identities. Their relationship went way back years ago. J. Jonah Jameson had always hated masked heroes. Heroes who hid behind their mask to save people. He termed them as vigilantes and they performed duties outside their jurisdiction. They took on the position of the government and the law enforcement agents. This angered Jonah. One of the earlier heroes who annoyed J. Jonah Jameson more was Daredevil. Jameson had lived in New York for a while, and he saw the rise and fall of different heroes and supposed heroes. He felt it was his responsibility to unmask every masked hero, as they like to call themselves. J. Jonah Jameson Jr. was just 17 years old when his life fell apart. His family was having a nice evening dinner when they heard a knock on their door. An inquisitive Jonah rushed to check the door. He forgot to inspect the peephole like he was told to do. He opened the door and some men in black ski masks invaded their home and ruined their peaceful dinner. Jonah could do nothing but cry and feel guilty. They had invaded his home because of him. His dad, who was stubborn and not used to being subdued, tried to fight one of the robbers who had laid his hands on his wife, Jonah's mom. The robber shot Jonah's dad in the chest three times. Jonah stared at his dad's blood, stained the wool carpet. Feeling anger, bravery, fear, and the need to display his anger, Jonah yelled and ran toward the robbers and hit one of them. He clung to the robber's arm and bit it. The robber yelled, shook his hand, and Jonah crashed to the floor. He turned his gun and pointed it at Jonah's head. Jonah's mom, who was still in shock, dove in front of the barrel of the gun before the robber shot. Jonah lost two of his parents to the masked men. To him, everyone behind a mask was no different from a criminal. He was sent into foster care. This was where he met one of the foster kids, Mac Gargan. Mac Gargan was not like the other kids. Mac was different. He had almost the same view as Jonah about the world, and most importantly about the heroes. Mac wanted to become an investigator in order to find out the criminals behind notorious crimes, while Jonah wanted to become a journalist so he would be able to expose those masked heroes. Their similar purpose made them bond. 
They grew up as brothers until Jonah was adopted by a family. The adopted man owned the Daily Bugle and had employed Jonah. Mac Gargan had eventually become the investigator. I highly sort after one. Do to his zeal to uncover criminals, it was easy for Jonah and Mac to work together. It had been years since they were apart, but their bond was still stronger than ever. Their first work together was to uncover the masked vigilante. Daredevil had been performing his vigilante work in New York for some time, and like every hero, some people liked him and some didn't. Jonah belonged to the category that didn't like him. Jonah used his new position as a reporter of the Daily Bugle to canvas an anti-Daredevil propaganda. He had hired his friend, Mac Gargan, because he was the only one who he trusted in the novia stage of his career. Mac Gargan was to reveal his identity. Daredevil had heightened senses. He was super aware and conscious of his environment due to his chemical blindness at an early age. Mac Gargan was very good at what he did. He was skilled. This was why it was easy for him to rise through the ranks in his work. Mac had been more than happy their dreams had somehow materialized even when they were separated for years. Mac had heard of the vigilante and he knew how Jonah felt about them because Jonah had trusted him to tell him what had happened to his parents when he was younger. Mac knew that revealing the identity of this vigilante would mean a lot to his foster brother, as they loved to call themselves. It was easy to hear the news about where the vigilante was. The police had given him sort of an opportunity to do part of their work for them. They had an understanding. The vigilante usually showed up early and did all the dangerous and difficult work and contacted the police after he was done. Their relationship was symbiotic, but Daredevil was always contacted by the police, primarily to inform him of where the issue was going down before he arrived at the scene. Mac Gargan was able to tap into this line and eavesdropped on the information they supplied to the vigilante. When he told Jonah, Jonah was angry that the police were cooperating with a criminal. Jonah expressed his anger in more sinister posts about the vigilante. He had twisted the story to make it look like the vigilante had forced the police into his pockets through threats. His information was not sourced from anywhere or proven. It was purely sentimental. Mac was able to identify that the bandwidth of the secure line the police used to contact the vigilante was a metropolitan area network. The vigilante was somewhere around the vicinity of the police station. Mac had gone as far as deploying drones when he heard about another issue for the vigilante to solve. He had deployed the drones to the scene and had seen everything that had occurred. When the fight was over and the vigilante had secured the criminals and alerted the police, he began to flee. He followed the vigilante using the drone. Adamant in the skill of flying due to his love for planes, Mac maneuvered the drone through the corners that the vigilante was breezing through. He rounded around a corner and lost him. He rotated the camera and it didn't see a sign of him. Mac began to retreat when he spotted the vigilante standing on a fire escape, staring directly into the drone's camera. He threw his cane and broke the drone's propellers. The drone cascaded and crashed to the ground. Mac yelled in frustration and noted that the vigilante was more skilled and aware than he thought. He would have to find another method. After one of the fights, Mac had quickly rushed to the scene before the vigilante in order to observe him from a closer range. He wasn't planning to engage. He wanted to see the savviness of the vigilante for himself. Daredevil had arrived shortly after and he had begun to beat the said criminals who had been kidnapping a set of children. Mac observed the vigilante and was faster, more sensitive than the criminals. He avoided their fists and their weapons easily, like he could see it coming. He had beaten them, wounded rope around them, and had contacted the police. The vigilante stretched his cane to tap from the van and release the children who screamed in unison. He then waited for them before the police came. He left immediately he heard the sirens. 
Mac had observed how the vigilante relied on his cane. This forced him to believe that the vigilante might be blind with heightened senses. He had quickly released this information to Jonah, who had wasted no time in publishing it. Jonah went as far as offering a momentary reward for anyone who knew about the identity of the vigilante. The monetary reward was donated by a sponsor who hated the vigilante as much as Jonah, the kingpin. Matt Murdock, Daredevil, had been observing the recent publications from the Daily Bugle, and they were getting more outrageous, yet they had some truth in it. He needed to be more careful about everything. He saw the huge sum of money and knew that the Daily Bugle had started making waves weeks ago, and he would be incapable to producing such an amount. His mind went to his ex-girlfriend, whom he had trusted with the secret identity, Karen Page. They had broken up due to her addiction and substances. Matt feared that, as he had seen the news of the reward for his identity, she would be tempted to reveal his identity for the money to spend it on her drug addiction. Karen Page saw the news. A greater part of her salivated at the assumption price plastered across the paper. The smaller part of her still loved Matt and knew he would suffer a lot if she revealed his identity to the public, but she didn't care. What they shared was history. With the sum for his identity, she would be rich and set for life. She would be able to stock up her drugs and saw that she was going to the Daily Bugle news house. She rolled the paper and walked to it. She was about to become rich, and she didn't care about what Matt thought. The small part of her still felt something for him, screaming, but she had made her decision. Karen walked through the doors of the Daily Bugle. She had thought over her decision, and there was no going back. She was intent on getting the cash reward, and she knew she was going to get it. If there's anything the Daily Bugle cherished more than revealing the identity of the vigilante, it was their reputation. They didn't want to be known as a fraudulent media house. She walked into the receptionist and asked to see the reporter, J. Jonah Jameson. She was asked her intention and she replied that it was the identity of the vigilante. She knew who he was. When the receptionist relayed the message to the secretary at Jonah's office, Jonah immediately asked the secretary to inform the receptionist to usher the woman in. Karen sat unsteady. She bounced her feet repeatedly waiting for the man to enter the conference room, which she had been ushered into. Karen appeared shabby. She was on her last dosage of heroin, and she needed her new fix. She stared at her fingers and spotted needle marks. She rubbed them. She convinced herself that she was doing the right thing. The thick glass doors opened and Jonah breezed in. When he spotted Karen, he recoiled a little bit. Shocked at her appearance, but he was prepared for anything. Any witnesses was better than none. Jonah walked towards her, hiding his mask of worry. He didn't want her to waste his time. Since they had put the advert in the newspaper, they had been a series of call-ins with fake information trying to swindle the money from them. Jonah always had to check out their information in case he hit the jackpot. None ever checked out. He didn't relent. He attended to every one of them. His building had been a madhouse that morning. A lot of people had come in to relay their information. It had died down a little over midday. This was when Karen had come in. Jonah went straight to the point. He was exhausted and he needed a break though. She asked for the money before she divulged into the information. Jonah laughed. He heard this before, but her confidence entitlement made the demand more ridiculous. He told her that she would get the money after they had verified her claims. Karen didn't believe him, but she had no choice. She wasn't going to do anything with the information of who the vigilante was, so she could use it in the hopes of making money. Karen wanted to sign a contract. J. Jonah Jameson smiled. The woman knew what she wanted. He had a secret. He had a secretary draft a contract while he entertained Karen with pastries and drinks. In a matter of minutes, the secretary brought a contract. Karen read through it and saw what she needed to sign. Jonah signed as well. She shook hands with him and folded the contract paper into her bag and zipped it. She told Jonah that 
he would keep her out of the newspaper as the source of the information to which he agreed and, and swore up upon. She revealed his identity. She told him that the vigilante whom to whom some reference to as the daredevil was Matt Murdock, the legal practitioner. J. Jonah Jameson stared at her, dumbfounded, wondering if it was a joke. He knew who Matt Murdock was, and he represented him because he was a terrific lawyer, even with his blindness. Karen explained further. She told him all about Matt's childhood and how he had assumed the role of Daredevil in an attempt to keeping the city safe and prevent a reoccurring of what had happened to him when he lost his sight. Jonah knew that Karen was bent on selling the story, but there was something in him that believed her. He immediately called Matt Gargan and told him what she had told him. Mac replied, that he would investigate the situation. Mac had been doing his own investigation. He knew that the vigilante was blind from the very first day. This combated with the story the informant had been given him. The next item she had told him was about the cane. The maroon themed cane he carried. It was a no brainer. He would have chopped it down to the fact that she had seen him during one of his night patrols, but she was descriptive. Mac knew he had eventually had to break into Matt Murdock's office that night to find out if there would be any more evidence that would link Matt to the vigilante. Mac told his plans to Jonah, who overheartedly agreed he wanted it to be done as soon as possible. Jonah was getting itchy, the good itch, when he felt a good story was by the corner. Mac waited patiently till the light in his office went off. He waited till he left the building. He had been scouting the place for three days and knew the schedule of the guards. They stayed in front till Matt Murdock left. Matt was always the last person to leave. After he left, the guards all left. They locked the doors and went inside to drink. When the guards jammed the doors, they never double checked. Mac had weighed gum into the latch this would prevent the door from locking. When Mac was sure that the guards had started drinking, he walked cautiously across the street to prevent suspicion. He held the door and pulled it open. He smiled to himself. Things were looking good already. Mac prayed that Matt hadn't changed the locks on his doors. His girlfriend Karen Page had a spare key, which she provided for him to access the office. If he couldn't access the office, then there would be a problem. He reached the office where Matt's name was engraved into one of the glasses. The lock turned when he rotated the key. Mac smiled again. Things were going well. He entered the office and silently closed the door. He began a search. He had made sure to come with gloves and a mask, just in case of security cameras. Mac saw the house address of Matt on one of the files he had signed. He went ahead to search for any clues. He tried to access the system, but he was locked out. He tried using the password that Karen had told him, but he had changed it. Mac ensured to place everything in place. He heard the sound of footsteps. He checked his watch. He had totally forgot that they checked Matt's office every hour on hour. He freaked out and hit something that bent awkwardly. A shelf moved. Mac stared into the small space that had been created by the move. He shifted the shelf, and it opened wider. He entered the secret room and closed it. He rubbed his hands along the wall and switched on the light. The vigilante costume hung on the wall, the cane, the mask, every evidence Mac needed. He took pictures and sent them to Jonah. Matt Murdock was indeed the daredevil. Location, the Daily Bugle. Time, 4.21 p.m. Date, January. 2025. J. Jonah Jameson came back to reality. He had been thinking about how he had met Matt Gargan and how he trusted him. They had been through so much together. That's why he knew he was just the right person to help reveal the identity of Spider-Man. But he needed him to track Peter. The photographs of Spider-Man were too good to be mere coincidences. Maybe they would get lucky again. He put a call through to him and picked up immediately. Their conversations were enjoyable and full of jokes, regardless of how old they were now. When Jonah mentioned that he had a job for Mac, he stopped. Mac became serious, and after the years had passed, Mac was a different person and asked what this was about. 
Jonah told him that he needed an old favor from a friend to reveal the identity of Spider-Man, but he would want him to follow a boy whom he suspected was affiliated with him. Mac chuckled. He knew these plans long before. Adrian Toomes once had asked the same question to find the identity of Spider-Man. Mac chuckled. He knew that Jonah had been obsessed with Spider-Man for so long that he was patiently waiting for the day Jonah would ask him for his help. Mac told him that he had been waiting for him to ask. Jonah laughed and asked him when he would come into town. Mac replied that he was already in town, concluding a case that he would be at his place that night and would reveal full details of the boy he needed to follow. Jonah ended the call and smiled. His hunch was never wrong. It had been over a week plus since Jonah had welcomed Mac into his home and told him his plans. His plans to uncover if there was a relationship between Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Mac had immediately put himself to work after he had gotten all the information about Parker that Jonah had, which wasn't much. His home address was nowhere to be found. His address was on the internet, and which he lived with his Aunt May before she died. There was a lot they didn't know about Parker. Jonah had been swayed by his photography skills and forgot to make inquiries. Jonah had to call Peter in to provide certain information about where he lived and his relatives. Peter filled the forms but filled Harry's address. He told Jonah that he was staying with him. Jonah knew it wasn't true, but he couldn't question him. Mac had been following Peter steadily. He had asked Jonah to request Peter to take another shot. This would enable Mac to truly find out if Peter was related to Spider-Man, or was very good at his job. Following Peter had proved difficult. Mac always followed him when he left school, but he always went missing under his watch. Mac always lost him. It had happened every time Mac trailed him. Mac reported this to Jonah. Mac was more interested in it because it was strange. Mac employed more hands. He wanted to find out where Peter disappeared to every single time after school and before reaching the house. Yet even with more hands, Peter still proved to be difficult. Mac and his men lost track of Peter regardless of where he was, and it was difficult following him. They ensured that they sent different men in order for Peter not to suspect anything, but their efforts were in vain, as Peter always eluded them. Peter had noticed Mac for the first day he trailed him. He had suspected it. He had suspected it. His tingle went off. He shrugged off the feeling. Considering the man he suspected couldn't hurt him, on the street, and Peter was more than able to disarm him, which would give him enough time to escape. Peter walked on and the man followed after him. He stayed afar off and placed his hands on his cheek, like he was swiping off a lint every time Peter turned to stare. Peter knew he was following him. He didn't know why, but he didn't want to find out. Peter was very skilled at evasion due to his abilities. He would disappear when he was blocked from the view of the man trailing him. Peter didn't just like that. He waited till he turned the corner before he quickly maneuvered himself to lose the man. It worked. The following day, Parker noticed the same man, but in different outfits. Peter had assumed that the trailing would be one day events, but seeing the man the following day became unnerving. His tingle was acting up, unnecessary, making Peter tense up a bit. He did the same thing. He maneuvered when he rounded the corner and he lost the man. He eventually summoned enough courage and told his friends, Harry Osborne and Gwen Stacy. Eddie wasn't a student in the college. Things had been going smoothly in his friendship with the duo. They were accommodating and helping him find a balance. He had gradually begun to accept a new life without his friends, Ned and his girlfriend, MJ. When he told them about it, they told him that he was overreacting and that no one was following him. They told him that it was probably a coincidence. Peter had not revealed to anyone that he was Spider-Man, so he didn't know how best to explain to them what he had just witnessed. So he kept quiet and settled for their reasonings. When he spotted the man the following day, he told them again. When different men started trailing him, Peter told them once again. They were worried. Harry opted to follow Peter home in order to spot the men who were trailing him. Peter agreed. It was easy for Peter to spot the men. Even in their casual civilian clothes, they stood out like a sore thumb. They couldn't act normal. They were always talking into their wrists, wearing sunshades, 
leaning against the wall or darting their eyes around whenever he looked at them. Peter showed Harry, who immediately realized that Peter was indeed being followed. Peter quickly took Harry to different places in order to lose the men who were trailing him. As the days passed, it became harder to evade the men, as they were always multiplied in numbers. It was becoming risky for Peter to do his job. His boss, J. Jonah Jameson, was becoming more demanding with the pictures, and with the men trailing him, it was harder to take Spider-Man pictures in just any alleyway. But Peter found ways to get it done. He needed a job. He needed the money. It was now March, and Jonah was becoming impatient. He had expected some results. A month had passed since Mac began to trail Parker, and there were zero results. They had not been able to find a correlation between Peter and Spider-Man, regardless of the amount of men they put in. Peter still delivered the pictures as when they were due. Jonah realized that he had been looking at the issue from a wrong perspective. Peter had no relationship with Spider-Man. He was just very good at what he did. He had to come to this conclusion when Peter had submitted photos the very day Mac had employed about 20 men to trail him. They had seen an image of Spider-Man in an alleyway, and they had seen Peter too at the same scene taking pictures. He was impatient because he had changed the task of his friend. He had asked him to reveal the identity of Spider-Man, but that was proving to be more difficult than to reveal Daredevil. J. Jonah Jameson had a last resort, a plan, which he would rely on if everything failed. Everything was failing and that plan was seemingly becoming a possibility. He silently prayed that the doctor would still be in agreement with him when he picked up the phone to call Dr. Farley Stillwell. Dr. Farley Stillwell had been waiting for months. After his last conversation with Jonah, he had gotten told Jonah what he wanted to do. He had studied animal mutation for a while and had gone as far as testing the serums he had made from combining different samples he had taken from different animals. He would test the samples on different animals to see the results and the gradual process of the mutation. So far, the last trial had been a success, and he felt he was ready to try it on humans. He consulted Jonah because of his popularity to tell him his plans. Initially, Jonah had vehemently disagreed, but Dr. Farley had used his Achilles heels against him. Spider-Man. He told him that he was going to inject the test subject with a sample, which he had drawn from a scorpion. This would give the test subject the powers of a scorpion. He explained to Jonah that since the scorpion was a natural predator to spiders, this would turn the scorpion into Spider-Man's arch enemy. Jonah listened to reason. He understood. He asked for further details on the stability of the testing phase, which Farley convinced him that he had tried it several times in other animals, and it was completely safe. Jonah had left Dr. Farley, asking him to do more experiments to ensure that the sample was completely safe to be tested on humans. That was the last conversation Dr. Farley had with J. Jonah Jameson. Farley had done what Jonah had asked for. He had retested the sample and made sure that they were compatible with every species of household animal. He didn't want his first human test subject to be a failure or to produce advert effects. When Jonah had called, he was excited. He had agreed. The samples were ready to function. He gave Jonah a time and a location for the experiment before Jonah ended the call. After Jonah had finished with this call, Dr. Farley, he had immediately called Matt Gargan. Jonah loved Mac, but he loved his job more. He needed to reveal the identity of Spider-Man. He asked Dr. Farley, and he asked if he had tested and retested the process, and he confirmed that it was safe enough to test on humans. Jonah knew that he may have a hard time convincing Mac to take the serum, but he would do whatever it took. Jonah had to set up a meeting with Mac in his office. Mac was punctual as usual, and Jonah wasted no time in opening the floor for his pitch. He told Mac how he had followed and trailed Parker, plus he had been unsuccessful. He told him that there was a way to enhance his detective abilities and make him more skillful. He loved the ability to detect things that other people couldn't. Every case that he found that was unsolved, 
He wanted to take it up. The deal Jonah was offering was intriguing. He wanted more skill. He needed it. But he was not prepared for the suggestion he made. Jonah had told Mac about the test and his plans. Mac disagreed. He didn't want to undergo any experiment with someone who he immediately judged as a quack. Jonah tried assuring his fears by giving him assurance that he had witnessed the injection of the serums on the various test subjects that had been successful. Jonah explained all the abilities he would receive after the test. Jonah had gone as far as promising to deposit over a hundred thousand dollars for him to go through with it. Mac trusted Jonah, but at that moment he was having his doubt. He was about to undergo an experiment that hadn't been conducted on humans yet. What if it went wrong? What if he died? A lot of what-ifs ran through his mind, inasmuch as he loved Jonah like family, and the amount that Jonah was promising, he loved his life more. He turned down Jonah's offer. Jonah was disappointed, but he had come too far to be deterred by Mac. He decided he was going to threaten him. Mac had not been a clean detective per se. His means of acquiring certain evidence were against the law that he stood for. And J. Jonah Jameson also knew that Mac was working with Adrian Toomes a couple years ago. And with that, he was called a dirty cop. He was involved in certain drug smuggling schemes in order to get more cash. Mac had trusted Jonah so much that he had confined in him. Jonah hated that he had to play on the blackmail card, but he had to do it. He blackmailed Mac. Mac was shocked and his demeanor changed. He became angry. He started questioning Jonah as to why he would blackmail him. He thought that they were friends. Jonah at this point didn't care anymore. He gave Mac the location of the experiment and told him to leave his office. Mac felt hurt and betrayed. Jonah still promised to give him the money as compensation. Mac told him that after the experiment and after the whole Spider-Man menace, that Jonah should never call him ever again. Jonah nodded. Career over family was Jonah's mantra. Location, a warehouse. Date, March 25th, 2025. To say Mac Gargan was scared was an understatement. He was strapped to a table while the doctor walked around touching the computer and checking his vitals. Mac cursed Jonah over and over. Jonah had betrayed him, he had blackmailed him into going through with the experiment. After Dr. Stilwell had ensured that everything was normal, he took out the sample from the cold box he had kept it. He used a syringe to draw out the serum from its vial and moved towards Mac to insert it into him. Mac didn't want to scream. It was already humiliating enough, the position that he was in. Crying would make it worse. Jonah had refused to follow him to the warehouse, where the doctor was going to carry out the experiment. He had just given him the location and he had left. Dr. Stilwell rubbed alcohol on Mac's arm and inserted the scorpion DNA into him. Nothing happened for the next hour. Mac stared, silently prying that the experiment had failed. Stillwell signed. It had failed. He had moved to Unity Mac when Mac began to convulse slowly at first but it became more violent. The DNA of the scorpion and his were splicing and merging, trying to be one. Dr. Stoa watched as everything happened. Mac tore through the restraints and fell on the floor. Pain shut through his bones. Mac screamed in pain and passed out. Dr. Stoa stared at Mac till the process was done. He was going to add retractable mechanical stingers to him, reminiscent of an actual scorpion. He had immediately called Jonah to inform him about the success of the experiment. Everything was functioning just like it had planned out to be. Jonah had been happy to receive the news. He had helped in creating the biggest villain Spider-Man would ever face, and in the end, he would get his big reveal. When Mac woke up, he was a bit dizzy, till his mind stabilized. He felt the same. He saw the doctor still staring at his vitals on the screen. He tried to stand out, but was bombarded with a massive headache. He held his head, the shuffle alert. Dr. Stilwell, who turned and looked at him. He quickly rushed to him and presented him 
with food. Stilwell had presented him with spiders in a container. He wanted to test how far the scorpion DNA had infiltrated Mac's DNA. Max stared at the moving spiders, then at the doctor who urged him to eat. Mac was very hungry and he decided that if he hadn't undergone the experiment, then there was nothing to fear in eating spiders. Mac put one in his mouth and bit. His taste buds exploded with joy. He had never tasted something so good. Mac rushed through the spiders and finished them all. Dr. Stowell nodded. He needed to keep him around for the next few tests before he would release him. He felt proud of himself. He had accomplished what most scientists had thought possible. Peter was slowly becoming his old self again. The initial tears that would form in his eyes when he thought about Aunt May had reduced to just a, well, fob in his chest. It didn't hurt that much anymore when he thought about his friends. He had made new friends even though he knew that they would never be able to replace the previous ones. The fear that he had felt when he discovered that people had been following him was something he used to love. The thrill of fighting crime or being in pursuit of people. Peter had missed those days, and he had gotten a little taste of it. He had gone home one day, putting on the suit and swung around town. He wanted that rush again, he was more happy when he was swinging. He felt stupid for even considering to stop. Slowly, he had started fighting crime again. He had started from cat burglars, to rescuing people from fires to stopping armed robberies. He was coming back and he wanted the world to know that Spider-Man was back in full force. So far, every time he took a picture of himself in a Spider-Man costume, in order to give it to Jonah, hidden. He had always done it in such a hidden and secluded area. He ensured that no one saw the Spider-Man, but now he didn't care. He wanted the world to see him again. He was back at stopping bad guys, and he was better than he ever was before. Because this time, he was no more than the naive 15-year-old kid, but a mature 18-year-old who had experienced life. The experiment was a huge success. The merging of the DNA had given Max superior abilities. He had superhuman powers through the chemical and radioactive treatments, including splicing his genetics with the scorpion DNA, which produced effects. As a result, he had arachnid-like power similar to Spider-Man's, such as superhuman strength, speed, agility, reflexes, stamina, and durability. And he could also scale walls. He also punched holes in the walls as a way to climb. He also had a very strong grip of, re the, of real scorpion powers. In addition to his superhuman physique, he was armed with a cybernetic controlled 7 foot mechanical tail. With a tool steel articulate framework which could whip at 90 miles per hour. The tail was equipped with projectile weapons, an electric generator. It also had been equipped with a spike at its tip which could squirt an acid spray and a low plasma energy projection. Mac Gargan could use his tail as an extra leg, or he could coil it behind him to spring himself a distance of at least 30 feet. Every single practice had been concluded to discover the abilities of Mac Gargan, who was beginning to love the powers he had received. He's stronger than Spider-Man by far, and he knew he would finally be able to put Spider-Man to rest once and for all. Then he would visit J. Jonah Jameson. The superhuman abilities gave him an upper hand. He would be able to get whatever he wanted from Jonah. Mac had complained about some intermittent headaches and blackouts to Stillwell, who immediately stated that it was normal and it was his way of adapting to the changes of his DNA. Stillwell had gone through every test and had realized that Mac was stable enough to release. He called Jonah, who came to pick up Mac. When he arrived, he saw that Mac was looking better than ever before. Mac gave him a curt nod, and nothing more. Jonah quickly went to Dr. Stillwell to finish the certain terms of their agreement. Stillwell confined in that Jonah and told him that he had discovered an anomaly that could provide dangerous in the future. He told him that Mac had blackout episodes, 
where he lost control of himself and became a pure animal, a predator. It would last for only a minute each day. Jonah asked him not to inform Mac. Jonah asked if he was going to die, to which Dr. Farley responded in the negative. Spider-Man had become more adventurous lately and needed to put an end to that. Stowell nodded and shook his hands with Jonah and allowed him to take Mac. Jonah was to bring Mac in every month for some injections for a year before he would stop completely. This was to ease his body's mutation process. The one drive home, Jonah didn't mind the silence. He didn't want to make small talk. He wanted to talk about the next step. He reminded Mac of the plans that they had agreed to. Mac nodded and he smiled as the thought crossed his mind. Spider-Man would not know what hit him by tomorrow. Peter was in school when he heard the crash in the pandemonium. Something was happening and without seeing it, he knew it was a job for Spider-Man. His classmates had immediately rushed to the windows to view what was happening. Peter used this distraction to sneak out. He immediately put on his costume and dashed the empty hallway for the main door. As he stepped out, he saw people running. He looked at the directions from where they were running away from and saw smoke clouds. He immediately swung into action. He landed on the scene and the area was completely trashed. Cars were upturned, buildings had been broken into parts, and the roads had been torn off. Parker walked on through the thick smoke that was being released from an exploding car. As Spider-Man walked on, he felt his spider sense immediately shoot up, and he moved to the right side. He moved fast enough to miss the scorpion stinger that struck the ground. Parker turned and saw Mac Gargan, but a more advanced form. He was bigger than normal, and he had a green costume, and he had scorpion legs that balanced on a human torso. Peter had never seen anything like it before, but he wasn't going to let it keep destroying his city. Peter shot at it while he ran directly towards it. Mac turned and used his tail to sweep Peter off his feet. He was quick enough to turn back and hit Parker across the chest. This sent Parker crashing into a car. Spider-Man winced. He got up and charged again from a different angle. He swung to his feet to connect with Mac's head. But Mac saw it in time and he moved and grabbed Peter by the back of his leg and slammed him into the ground. Parker tried different techniques and methods but he could never land a hit on the villain. Mac was faster and more agile than Peter was. It was easier for him to evade Peter. Mac was tired of the weak attempts Spider-Man was giving him in the fight. He had wondered if it was the same masked hero that bothered Jonah so much. He wanted to get the fight over with. He held Peter by the throat and pressed him against the wall. Spider-Man struggled to breathe. He clawed at Mac's vice-like grip on his throat. Mac used his other hands to slowly pull the mask of Peter. Then Mac blacked out. The animal instinct took over. He released his grip on Peter's throat, making Peter suck a mouthful of air into his lungs. He pulled his mask over his head as Mac began to convulse again. The feats of the convulsion were becoming frequent and more dangerous. Mac would be pushed into a corner of his own mind, and the scorpion instinct took over. But this time, Mac forced himself to wake up. But the scorpion alter ego had not retreated. Mac was battling with the scorpion alter ego in his mind. Peter just stared as the villain screamed. His body mutated from human to scorpion. Mac began to flee. He didn't know what was wrong, but he needed to be alone to find out. Location, an abandoned building. Mac was confused and disoriented when he broke into an abandoned building. The headache had intensified like his head was about to split in half. Mac threw up blood and he tried to reach the doctor several times but the man had disconnected the line. The doctor had known about the side effects and had deliberately let him leave the warehouse. Mac was angry, angry at the pain he was feeling, angry at the fact that something was trying to take control of his mind, angry that someone who he had trusted his whole life had blackmailed him into the experiment. He knew whose fault it was. It was J. Jonah Jameson's fault. He never wanted to go through with the experiment, but Jonah had forced his hand. 
Now, Jonah was going to get his headline. He was going to decapitate him. He was going to make him suffer the consequences of the experiment. Mac was struggling to take control from his alter ego. The pain ravaged from his tailbone, through his spine to his brain. Mac screamed as his vision blurred. Mac's world began to spin. Tears formed in his eyes. He felt like he was going to die, but he swore that he would have his vengeance on Jonah, one way or another. Mac passed out. Peter's heart was beating. He had almost died. He had never been so scared before. Peter had never fought anything like that villain. He had never seen anything like it. It was stronger than anything he had ever seen. Faster, more agile. Peter wasn't sure how he was supposed to defeat him. He removed his mask and cried. If he was back where he was some months ago, he was sure his friends would have helped him and Tony Stark would have come for the rescue. Peter felt the emotions and the tears and he smelt the blood that was on his body. He missed everything so much that it hurt. He was alone, and today's fight had made him realize it. If he had been killed, no one would mourn for him because there was no one who ever remembered him. Peter's face hardened. They were dead, and he needed to move on. Crying would not bring them back, neither would it help him with the villain. He needed to find a way to defeat him all by himself. Peter looked around to ensure that there was no one watching him. He slid down the wall as his body ached. He needed a strategy. He didn't know what he needed to do. He didn't know what had made the villain convulse or why he had fled when he woke up. But what he knew was that he couldn't fight him using brute force because of how strong he was. Neither he could outrun him because of how fast and agile that he was. He knew he would have to engage him in a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight, which he had never seen the villain use during the fights. Peter attached his web to the fire escape and pulled himself through. He entered through his window and crashed to the floor. Without removing his suit, he closed his eyes. He needed all the rest that he could get because he felt the attack wouldn't last long. The Daily Bugle. It had been over a week and nothing had happened. Peter had healed, but the villain hadn't come back. The news of the fight between the villain and Spider-Man had been splashed all over the news. Championed by the Daily Bugle, who unsurprisingly took the side of the villain, Peter had been surprised when he got to work, found that photos had been taken. When he reported to Jonah, Jonah was in a happy mood. He had immediately told Peter to write a report on what he had seen, since Peter told him that he had seen what had happened. Everything happened so fast to Peter. One minute, everything was quiet. The next, there was a loud crash from the general hall. Then there were screams. Peter and Jonah darted out to check what was happening. Peter sighted the same man who had been trailing him, and he looked very familiar. Mac was furious. When he had woken up, there was one thing in his mind. To kill Jonah. That was what he was there to do. Peter needed to suit up, but he couldn't do that with everyone watching him. Unconsciously, he stepped in front of Jonah to protect him. Jonah's face was a mixture of confusion and shock. He ignored Peter and asked Mac what he wanted. Mac laughed and told him that he had come for revenge. He told him that his obsession to reveal the identity of Spider-Man had pushed him to become what he was. Mac narrated the turmoil that he had faced, the pains he had undergone, and how Jonah had abandoned him as a friend. He narrated the fact that he was faced with an alternate personality that made him a savage being, but he had come to a sort of agreement with it. They could work together. Mac Gargan smiled as he transformed into his half-scorpion nature. He took control, his transformations now that he was able to accept the other part of him. Mac rushed towards Jonah, who was blocked by Peter. Jonah made a run for it. He ran to his office and locked it. Mac wasn't here for Peter. He rushed past him towards Jonah's office. Parker immediately stripped off his clothes into the hallway and activated the suit. He needed to save Jonah and stop the creature. Parker rushed into the office. The walls which supported the doors had been broken down, and the office was in disarray. Parker saw the scorpion holding Jonah by the collar, dangling him over the edge of the building. They were on the 12th floor, and a fall from that height would mean imminent death. Peter rushed towards the scorpion who turned and chuckled and left Jonah to fall out of the building. Peter slid in between scorpion's legs and jumped out of the building without a second thought. 
He shot his web at Jonah, whose hands were outstretched, looking for something to hold on to. Before Jonah hit the ground, the web caught him, and Peter pulled himself and him to prevent him from slamming his head to the ground. Due to the momentum of the fall, Peter caught Jonah before he rotated himself and quickly attached his web to a post in order to lessen the impact of the crash. Parker held Jonah in his arms as he crashed. He took the force of the impact. Peter looked up and saw that the scorpion was still staring out of the window, fuming at the survival of Jonah. Spider-Man turned to Jonah, who was shocked that Spider-Man had saved him despite everything that he had written and said about him. Parker asked if he was okay, which Jonah answered with a slow nod. Still in the state of shock and befundlement, Mac was livid. Spider-Man had saved Jonah. It was a high time he finished what he had tried to do some time ago. Mac leaped from the building and landed on the ground. He pushed aside the cars that were blocking his way, and he charged towards Spider-Man. Spider-Man had taken his time to do his research. He had studied scorpions, their strength, and their weaknesses. The scorpion mostly relied on his powerful stinger, which scorpions did too. He needed to detach the stinger from his body, and he would be weaponless. Peter knew that he couldn't outrun the scorpion. He felt that he would stand a better chance if the tail was removed. He told Jonah, who was still standing to run to safety, that he would try and stop him. Parker shot his web rapidly at Mac's feet. Before he reached him, Mac used his tail to squirt acid on the webs, which dissolved like ice and fire. Parker stared in shock. That was new. The fight between the duo had been fierce and had left Spider-Man bruised and battered, but he never gave up. He thought of a way quickly. He attached his web to a lamppost and swung himself. He hit Scorpion across the face temporarily, distracting him. Peter pushed himself into the air, aiming for the tail of the Scorpion. He landed on the mechanical tail with force, but nothing happened. It didn't cut or break off. Mac whipped his tail quickly and it released jolts of electricity due to the inner built generator. It threw Parker backwards and he crashed into the power plant. He groaned in pain. He supported himself with the plant and stared at Mac, who was walking towards him with a fierce look in his eyes. Peter had to think of something, unless this would be his last battle. Peter looked at his hands. He stared at the mechanical tail of Mac. He hoped that his plans would work. He waited. He wanted Scorpion to reach him and he needed to aggravate him also. Peter shot webs at Scorpion's face who blocked it in time. Spider-Man attached his webs to a building debris from one of the destroyed buildings and smashed it against Mac's head. It had done the trick. Scorpion charged towards Peter. Filled with rage, he used his tail like a scorpion. Peter gripped the stinger and prayed that Mac would not squirt acid on him. He needed Scorpion to apply more pressure so that it would penetrate deeply into the plant. Scorpion applied more pressure using the tail. Spider-Man buckled under the pressure. He immediately swayed to the side and let Mac's tail puncture the plant. The currents in the plant surged through the mechanical tail. And through Mac's body, Peter slowly backed away. The inner built generator began to overheat and it exploded. Location, Peter's apartment. The heroic act of Spider-Man saving J. Jonah Jameson had convinced him not all masked men were criminals. Jonah tendered an apology through his newspaper article. When he wrote about Spider-Man saving him, he considered Spider-Man as a hero now. Peter was satisfied and happier than ever before. He had been able to defeat the villain by himself without Tony Stark or the help of the Avengers or his variants. He smiled to himself at how he had grown up so fast. His new friends had been a massive help too. They had helped him heal emotionally. He was better than he was before, and he knew he would only get better in time. Peter smiled at his reflection in the mirror. As he prepared for school, he heard a knock on his door, and Peter assumed it was Harry or Gwen. Peter opened the door and stared into the glasses of Matt Murdock, Daredevil. And that is going to be, if I had written, the MCU's Spider-Man 4 movie. Now what do you think Spider-Man 4 would have been like if this would have happened? Would you have liked to have seen the Scorpion 
be intertwined in the fourth installment. I don't know what a lot of people would think about the storyline, but I really went back to basics. I really wanted to do more of a comic book storyline, but kind of build these relationships with Harry Osborn and Gwen because I wanted to showcase something a little bit differently. I didn't want to go in depth with, you know, Ned wanting to date MJ and then Ned becoming Hobgoblin and Peter getting jealous and then, you know, that whole shebang. I mean, I've seen the theories. I wanted something completely different and brand new, a fresh take. I wanted to, you know, kind of do my own thing here and really showcase Peter Parker as a character and J. Jonah Jameson by, you know, giving J. Jonah Jameson that backstory and, you know, showcasing Daredevil a little bit within the storyline, you know, it was touched a little bit. I didn't want to, you know, make Daredevil a huge part, but I do want to do that for, you know, Spider-Man 5, and I really want to showcase a little bit more. So I think with Spider-Man 5, we're going to see the symbiote suit in my storyline. I really have a great idea with, you know, Daredevil, Symbiote Spider-Man, a couple other things. So, what do you guys think of If I Had Written? Do you guys like these episodes? It's a little bit different from What Ifs. It's still fan fiction, but it's not considered a What If. So, it's a little bit different. It's where I do pre-writes, rewrites, canceled projects, and so much more. But that being said, do make sure to subscribe, like, share, and turn those notifications on so you and your friends are up to date with the latest content. I do want to say thank you so much for the support. It really means a lot to me. I cannot wait to continue doing these stories. It's going to be fantastic. Like, I cannot wait. I also do want to say if you guys want to commission stories or work with me like what Zachary did, I would highly recommend that you check out the Patreon as it's starting at just one dollar a month the help really goes a long way i would highly recommend can we get to 10 patreon members we're at seven currently i don't know if we can get to 10 but that would be fantastic if we could it would be amazing it would really help the channel out big time but thank you so much for tuning in it really means a lot and i cannot wait to see you in the next video take care and have a fantastic day